welcome to Views from the Sideline. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. My partner, Malik Hill. We're in the middle of July already. I can't even believe it. Um, NBA Finals in full swing. We've gotten three games through. Um, today we're going to talk about some uh, some baseball stuff. They had their midseason home run derby, all-star game. We uh, checked in on that. We're going to go back over some more of those draft prospects that we started talking about last week. We're going to talk about USA basketball for the Olympics because there's a lot of drama around that. One and two <sighs> in exhibition, exhibition games. Shaky start. <laughs> and then Probably there's... the shakiest start in <laughs> Team USA basketball history. Yeah. And there's also a few trade rumors and things going on. So, as we get closer to the NBA draft. So, I want to start off with the NBA Finals because that's kind of the front and center thing that's getting closer to ending. We have game four tonight. The Suns are up two to one now. So when we last left the show, it was one Oh, the Suns and the Suns had won uh game two, uh, pretty convincingly. Again, they won that game one eighteen to one Oh eight. The difference in that game was Giannis had 42 points, 12 rebounds, four assists, just the rest of the team couldn't get it done. Around him, Devin Booker also had a really good game for the Suns. Uh, he had 31 in that one. But the supporting cast, Chris Middleton, had a really bad game. Uh, 5 of 16, 11 points. So they weren't going to win that one. But in game three, the Bucks came out. They made a statement. And they were ready to go. Um, mostly in the second quarter is when they really pulled away. But Giannis had another... 41-point performance, 13 rebounds, 6 assists, only missed 4 free throws, which I think is huge for him. He was maybe the best he's ever been. Yeah. He's, he's been incredible in these finals. And on the opposite side for the Suns, Devin Booker really struggled in this one. He went 3 of 14, 1 of 7 from the 3. Uh, DeAndre Ayton and Chris Paul, they, they did their thing. They even got a good game out of Jay Crowder. He had six threes. Cam Johnson had a crazy run in yeah. the I, I can't remember if it was the third or fourth, but mm-hmm. there was like a three minute stretch where he scored like seven or eight points. Yeah. Also had a highlight reel dunk over PJ Tucker, yeah. which was great to see. Um yeah, and he had fourteen. So the big one really in this was that just Devin Booker wasn't going and he's kind of the catalyst for the Suns. Um Drew Holiday had a nice game for the Bucks in this one, 21 points. Um, but I'm glad because now at the beginning of the series, it looked like the Suns were just going to run away with it. And I think people were saying, oh, man, Suns in four, you know, that meme that's going, been going on. And I already know that the ratings are really down for this NBA Finals and people keep talking about it. Whatever. I, I don't care. Um. I feel like sporting events all over the place are going down in viewing. Um, but now it's a series because the Bucks looked real. Even in game two, they showed a little bit of sign with Giannis playing out of his mind. Game three, getting the actual dub off of it. And now game four, where they're still in Milwaukee. And any, I think anything can happen now. Like if Milwaukee wins this one again... Now it's tied back up, and now the Suns are sitting in a pretty rough spot because Giannis is starting to tear him up. How do you guard that? What do you do? I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, right now, I think Monty, Monty Williams is a good enough coach to eventually he was going to figure something out. I think I, I knew they were going to win at least one home game, and Giannis is – kind of difficult to deal with unless you build a wall around him but now the players around him are hitting shots and even Pat Connaughton was really trustworthy shooting in that last game PJ Tucker was hitting shots Bobby Portis has become almost an x factor for them off the bench they started to start him Mm -hmm. but this really to me is about it's time to fully respect Giannis Antetokounmpo I mean, even after two MVPs, there are people that still look at him as a one-dimensional guy that gets his stats but really doesn't get anything done, honestly. Mm -hmm. He is looking like an evolution of Shaquille O'Neal right now. Whether it's layups or dunks or 
in Shaq's prime, he could get a rebound and take it coast to coast and dunk it or dish off an assist. Giannis has his ups and downs with free throws, but that last game, like you said, he only missed four. He was almost in the zone from the free throw line. He wasn't taking forever to shoot. Mm -hmm. Back-to-back 40-point double-digit rebound games with, like, five or more assists. That you you don't just like skip over that. That is all time great NBA finals play. And hitting his free throws, which was a big concern for him going into this. Exactly. And it's even more impressive seeing that the injury that he came off of coming out of the Atlanta series. Game one against Phoenix, it seemed clear that he wasn't his self, but he still went and got like twenty and fifteen or something. Next game, it's still clear that Phoenix was the better team in that game and they were gonna win, but Giannis that good third quarter where he scored 20 or 22 points, he just went and he went to a different level that I didn't think he could go to. He was hitting like fadeaway jumpers, floaters, dunks, layups. They just couldn't stop him in any way. Mm-hmm. And then in game three, he just continues it. And this time with the crowd behind him. So the feet, the free throws start going too, along with him dominating in the paint and, and in every other way. It is it's wild to watch a guy that outside of Milwaukee, I don't think many people like have Giannis Antetokounmpo as their favorite player. Mm-hmm. Some people barely have him as a top three player. Like most people go like LeBron, KD, Kawhi, or Le- LeBron, KD, Steph. Yeah, and people just don't give him the respect he deserves, which he's he is a hundred percent earning right now because DeAndre Ayton has been a problem defensively and offensively for almost everybody throughout these playoffs. And Giannis is, like, babying DeAndre Ayton right now. Yeah. Nobody else has been able to do that, and Giannis is just treating him like he's – it's nothing there. And that's part of – part of it is because DeAndre Ayton is still a young player, mm-hmm. but he has a, like, David Robinson-type build where he's he's lean and he's extremely strong, and most players haven't been able to push him around. Right. Giannis is just taking him straight to the basket. Yeah. And whether it's free throws or layups or dunks, he's getting what he wants, and it's ridiculously impressive to watch right now. Right. And it's even though they're down to one, it seems like they have a lot of momentum right now because it's right back to home. And like you said, if they win this game, Phoenix is in a really weird spot. Yeah, especially when it's hard to stop Giannis right now. You got to remember, Giannis is also only twenty six. Um, to see where this guy has come from when he first came to the league, probably it might be the in, greatest transformation in NBA. History. He came in when he's eighteen, nineteen. Yeah. Um, looked like a twig. And he put on so much muscle, worked so hard. And people don't realize either, like, the the Shaq comparison is real. So I don't get why people are so hard on Giannis. And and maybe I don't remember because I was little at the time, but Shaq didn't break out until 2000, at least for a championship. He made playoffs and stuff with the Magic. He always was a solid player. Great. He never don't, fo- don't say solid. Great. <laughs> well, he never. He always fo- was great. Right, but that's what I'm saying. Giannis is yeah, also he did, great. He didn't. He didn't. Yeah, him winning the championship is what put him over. Yeah. Right, and that's where people start saying, "Oh, Shaq is the most dominant player in NBA, possibly NBA history," and now Giannis is matching that, and people are, I don't know, giving him a lot of criticism. It feels like there's. I I don't think there's criticism. I just I I think there's a there's something in people's heads where they just don't want to like love Giannis for some reason. And I don't love Giannis. I'm not like a huge fan of him, but for you to ignore the greatness that's happening right now would be absolute ignorance. Right. And just, that means you just have a problem with him for some reason. Mm -hmm. And that would make no sense. Cause from our view, he's a great dude that works harder than almost everybody. Yeah. And has gotten to this point because he's worked so hard. Yeah. And he wants to stick with a, an organization that drafted him, which you know, most other guys probably would have left by now. And he's stuck through it, which is cool. Um, I don't think, like, his team isn't the greatest around him, um, necessarily. They've made improvements. But still, I mean, we talked about, like, the team just doesn't fully fit around him. You need It feels like they need more shooting or something like that. Yeah, even with them getting Drew Holiday, which was a huge upgrade from Eric Bledsoe. Mm-hmm. Drew Holiday isn't a superstar. He's he's been widely known within the NBA as like the most underrated player, maybe of like this past decade. Yeah, because he's been locking up high level players and giving them buckets for years. Mm-hmm. 
But at the same time, he's not a superstar. He's not a great three-point shooter. He's a good three-point shooter. So he's getting a high volume, but even when he shoots 10 threes, he's not going to go eight of 10 most likely. He's going to go four or five of 10. If he gets hot, which he did in the last game, he hit like four straight threes at one point. Because he's that good of a player, he can have those moments. But Drew is more of the third guy. He's one of the best third guys you can have Mm -hmm. at any time in any era. Yeah. And the other thing you have to remember, too, is like the Suns tried to do a hack and shack type thing on Giannis. The difference is Giannis, even though he struggles at the line, he is still a better free throw shooter than Shaq ever was. And the scary thing, too, is that Giannis likes to attack. So, like, even if you start doing this this hack and shack kind of thing, he's not going to, like, waver in his mentality. Like, some dudes get frustrated. Um, trying to think, like, Dwight Howard, Ben Simmons in the past. Like, you see they get frustrated when they get hack a shack because it's it's annoying they hate it um but Giannis is just different where he really is he'll and keep coming back we're clearly seeing enough he is he's airballed at least like four or five times mm-hmm. at least in these playoffs so many dudes would just crumble and lose their confidence from that yeah but the fact that he just keeps attacking and keeps going never drops his head and then he comes around with this performance shooting like 14 of like 18 from the free throw line mm-hmm. there are got get like you said guys like ben simmons that just crumbled under the pressure so easily mm-hmm. he's mentally tougher than a lot of these guys and it's showing yeah. every single game mm-hmm. and like you said the the players he's playing with we are loving what bobby portis is doing for the milwaukee bucks but nobody will ever say bobby portis is one of the best players in the league right he is a trusted high level power forward off the bench Brooke Lopez has pretty much like become a three point shooting five that's reliable sometimes. Chris Middleton is an all star, but he's not one of the, he's he's a really good player, but most people wouldn't like have him even like close to a top ten player in the league. Like this is what Giannis is working with, yet he's still getting Milwaukee to this level is just something else. Yeah. Um. And then, like I said, with the Suns, I mean, they just they rely so much on Devin Booker. And Devin Booker just, he wasn't very good in the last game. I don't know if it's defensive schemes, you know, uh, the, the Bucks are putting on him. Also, Chris Paul also has been, he's been good, but he hasn't been great from what we saw in some previous games, I guess. Um, well, he... He's pretty. He's been pretty much like the most consistent person yeah, for the yeah, Suns in this that's series. What I mean. um, yeah. But in that case, but like, you you can't rely on him to average thirty, right? But you would hope that when Booker is struggling, that maybe CP3 stepped up. He didn't in Game Three. It's fine. I'm just pointing things out. Um, it's mostly they need a third guy right now. Like, is, is they have a really strong core. Because they go like eight deep. When they're healthy, they go almost nine or ten deep. Right. But Mikael Bridges is inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Jay Crowder is the king of inconsistency. That last game, he hit. He went like six of seven for three or like seven of eight. Yeah. But it didn't amount to much because Devin Booker was off and other people were off. Mm-hmm. Cam Johnson, honestly, has been surprisingly cons- consistent, but he doesn't play enough right. to get. And then DeAndre Ayton has, had his best game of the series last game. But Milwaukee was just too strong. Yeah, Cam Johnson did play thirty minutes in the last game. Yeah, so it's it's when it's when Phoenix gets those full efforts from everybody when right. everybody's like when that chemistry is showing and everybody's just on a roll playing together. Yeah, when Phoenix is at its best. But yeah, right. they they have these games where a few guys are off and it messes up a lot of what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean that's kind of it. It's like their three point. Shot just wasn't falling very well for them in the last one. And oh, we said it before. If if the Bucks can slow the pace down a little bit, it, it plays more into their favor because it gets Giannis in the half court and he can just work and tire people out. And that's the hard thing. So for me, I feel like the Suns are at that point where they need to say, we're going to let Giannis get his and just try to stop everybody else. Because I really don't know who's going to stop Giannis 
and it's probably going to take way too much energy to try to stop him. So I think you look at Middleton and Drew Holiday and just keep them off and let Giannis score 50 if if he wants. But, I mean, you do, obviously, you have to be able to score on the other end. That's that's kind of where the Suns are at right now. Um, so this is a big game four for both sides because the Bucks can get back in it. Yeah. But if the, the Suns win this one. Yeah, it might be curtains. Yeah. Because then it's like they're an elimination game. And as good as Giannis can be, I don't know if he can pull off some miracle to come back from 3-1 necessarily. Exactly. I'm I'm not expecting game six of the LA series, Devin Booker, to show up mm-hmm. where he just started off the first quarter unconscious. Right. And, and just with like, what do you end with? Like, people forget. What do you have, like 47? I don't know. 45? He like a lot of points. It, it's, it's weird how that game has almost like gone up in smoke and people don't talk about it. He was unbelievable in that game. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to quite be there, but he has to at least go for 35 to 30 at least to me. Yeah. At some point, whether it's the first or second half, he has to lock into that zone mm-hmm. to where, yeah, he, he just is that Devin Booker that we've seen he can be in these playoffs. Yeah. What's your prediction? Because by now, I believe, well, I guess game seven would be different. If it goes to seven, we'll – We'll have another episode. <laughs> yeah. So er- everybody is assuming Milwaukee's going to win this game. But I think the odds, Giannis playing at the level he's played at has raised the level of everybody else around him. And the do you, do you really think the odds of Giannis going for 40 in like over 10 rebounds, the odds of him doing that three straight times, how likely do you think that is? Three straight games of over 40 in – 10 plus rebounds. I honestly would say it's over 50%. I don't think it's much higher, but I feel like it's more likely that he does that than not. But you also said if they just let him play his, if they just let him do his thing and try to cover up everybody else. Right. So yeah, I think Monty Williams is going to have a plan for this game, especially they've had three days of rest. They've had so much time to study film, and CP3 has had so much time to dissect what he's – he's been able to get what he wants for the most part through these first three games. So at this point, it's going to be – it's going to have to be a balance for him of getting other, getting other guys in a rhythm while also taking a bit of a scoring load. Because mm-hmm. like I said, they're at their best when everybody is in a rhythm and they're playing off of each other, not just when CP3 and Devin Booker and Aiton have it going and right. certain other guys are off. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm gonna take Phoenix in this one. Okay. I'm gonna think I don't think it's gonna go into like the one twenties, maybe not even like the like one teens. I think it might be like one oh seven, like one oh four Phoenix. I think it's gonna be a tougher game, maybe a slower game. Monty Williams and CP three are really gonna go, gonna try to control the pace and make sure Milwaukee doesn't like get up and down playing fast like they've been doing, honestly, because when teams slow down Milwaukee, that's when they really start to, like, their half-court offense gets more sloppy. Mm-hmm. Like, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday start to go more ISO when they, like, start messing up more. Giannis doesn't get into a rhythm. So, yeah, I think they come out with more of a game plan in this one, and they they might let Giannis get his numbers, but, they, yeah, they try to hold back everybody else and make sure Chris Middleton, we've seen – he has his games where he's extremely up and the games where he's extremely down. There's not much of a middle ground. And Drew Holiday is almost the same way. So if you stop them too and just yet, like you said, just let Giannis do his thing. Game two, Giannis went crazy. Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday didn't play very well. That really needs to be the priority. I think Phoenix focuses on that and they they get this one. Okay. I actually think I'm going to go with the Bucks, winning two straight at home. Um. I feel like the Suns need a bigger wake-up call, I think. And if they lose tonight, I think that would get them in gear. Because I still think that the Suns are favored in this series. But like I said, if if the Bucks win tonight like I think they will, it really changes everything for Game 5. But I think it would give a big wake-up call for the Suns going back home. And that could be really big. Just my thoughts. I, I think... 
there's going to be one more game, which I, I think is going to be tonight, where Giannis and maybe Middleton get going. And the Suns have to make just a couple few more adjustments, I think. Um, but we'll see. I, I, either way, I, I want this series now to go six or seven. Because um, at first it did look like it was going to be maybe a blowout, but it's looking a lot closer now, which I'm excited for. Uh, okay, let's go back to the mock draft that we were looking at last week. Last week we went through kind of the top five as they're kind of, the top five guys are kind of those, what we would say somewhat for sure, top prospects. Cade Cunningham, Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, Jonathan Kaminga. As we get to six. Well, where we left off with Orlando, they just hired a coach, Jamal Mosley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, young assistant everybody's excited about. Kind of like um, mm-hmm. uh, MAU Doka. Yeah. So, what's your feeling about that, just quickly? <laughs> it's Orlando. It's a, it's a, I was just about to say. It's almost, if you said anything besides that, I would have been surprised. It's almost better that it's a younger coach, I think. Yeah. Um, good luck to him, I guess. He's got it. He's got time. The Magic might make some moves um, on draft night as well, so we'll have to see. Um, so if we're going off the same Bleacher Report mock draft that we did yeah. last week, they have Oklahoma City taking Scotty Barnes at six. Yeah. Scotty Barnes, the big uh, Florida State player. Um, kind of uh, – he's – I'll let you describe Scotty Barnes because he's like, he's kind of like a jack of all trades, master of none type kind of thing. But he also leans a little more towards the defensive yeah. side of the ball. I would I would compare Scotty Barnes. He is like, if you had to compare him to players, I'd say like Kyle Anderson and Ben Simmons. Mm-hmm. Kyle Anderson, his whole game is tailored to skill and playing at his pace and all high IQ. Mm-hmm. He's six eight. He's listed at power forward, but he's really a point forward, and that's pretty much where Florida State had Scotty Barnes playing this season. Mm-hmm. It was reported a few weeks before the season started that they were going to try out Scotty at point guard, and for most of the season, that's pretty much how they played him. They had him bring the ball up a lot of times. They would post him up sometimes, but it was really a focus on him, like running the offense, keeping things going, rebound, attack the basket when you need to, and score when you need to. Yeah, and. That's where Ben Simmons was his for the first few years of his career before he got terrified and lost all his confidence. But, yeah, he's 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, he's almost 6'10", honestly. He's really the size of, like, a real a true power forward, almost center. Yeah. But he's lean. He moves like a small forward. 7'3", seven, 7'4", seven, wingspan. S- exact crazy wingspan, long arms. His defensive potential is huge. He you he can run the point if you need him to, but I think he'll slide more into like a three or four in the NBA. But he he's going to be a playmaker mm-hmm. wherever he slides in on any team. I think yeah he averaged like I think like twelve points, like seven rebounds, and like five assists during the season, or it might have been like ten or eleven points too. Because he he didn't his focus was never scoring when he was in the game. Right, he only did it when he had to. And what I like about him is his level his level of competitiveness and aggressiveness is far beyond, far, far beyond Ben Simmons and, and more than Kyle Anderson. Like, this kid is, he's intense when he plays. Mm-hmm. He's screaming, he's making facial expressions, he's stomping, he's like, he's getting really into it when yeah. he plays the game, which I love the combination of his high, his high, high IQ, his playmaking, his defense, and, you know, he's not a quitter. His confidence right. isn't going to go away. He's in it every single game. He has the potential to be a super high level leader because he's going to talk to guys. He's he's going to be in people's faces, mm-hmm. and that's what I like about him the most. He he has all the physical like skills. He has a lot of like room to grow offensively, but in terms of all the areas you like, all the little things in a player, he's got all of it. Yeah. Plus, he's almost six ten. Mm-hmm. I like the thing that the article talks about how you could have um, Scotty Barnes alongside Alexei Pokashevsky, like just two big dudes. That oh, can yeah, do offensive all guy, of stuff. like guy Especially, you rely on for shooting and another guy you rely on right. for playmaking. Especially if Poku can keep uh, 
developing and getting a little bit bigger and stronger. Plus, you think of Shea Gilgis Alexander too. Like he's like a six five point guard, so like they'd be a big team. It'd be yeah. plus you got Lou Dort at the two, who's a defensive menace. Mm-hmm. Improved a ton shooting from three. Like they the the things they're putting together. Yeah, they are really really cool. It's, if they get Scotty Barnes, they'll be a fun young team to watch. Yeah, they they'll almost be like the Kings from a few years ago that won forty two games mm-hmm. and looked like the future was extremely bright before they messed it up again. Yeah, they could potentially be like that team, a team that hovers around like thirty eight, thirty nine, forty rent, forty wins, but they're not quite a playoff team yet. Yeah, like a team that could scare for a play. It's weird now how these teams like there are a lot of these bottom teams that like can threaten for the play in now. And that can show a lot of progress when it used to be, oh, you didn't make the playoffs. You got to keep working. Yeah, Oklahoma City Thunder, if they make this pick and things keep going in the right direction, they could be one of those teams that threatens for a play-in. Mm-hmm. Especially if things come together like they could. Yeah. Uh, now, on to the seventh pick for the Golden State Warriors. They have, in this mock draft, James Bowknight from Connecticut. He has been climbing up draft boards quickly. Very quickly. Um. And there's been teams that have talked about even putting him in the, their top five. Uh, the Pistons were one of them, actually. Um, I don't know how I feel about this fit. I get that they want, in this mock draft, they're talking about depth for their guards, for Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. But I don't know. I feel like Golden State should be looking for... More shooting. Yeah. Or like some replacement for, I feel like pretty soon here, there's going to be a trade that Golden State's involved with for either Draymond or Andrew Wiggins, where they're going to need forward or power forward depth rather than guard depth, I think. I think like they have guys like Jordan Poole, Nico Mannion. Now both of those guys are young and haven't had a lot of time. Jordan Poole's getting there. Nico he, Mannion he, Nick, is, Jordan Poole really started coming around the second yeah. half of the season and the, the play-in games. Right. And Nico Mannion, he's going to get a little bit more experience playing in this Olympic basketball, but he's still pretty raw to the league. Yeah. Um, but I think because they've gone guard for the most part, besides Wiseman last year, I don't know. I feel like I'd rather get that front court depth for them. I can see why you say that, but honestly, front court depth is honestly the thing where they're kind of – they can some they can rely on it right now, like you're you're talking to the future and like future moves that will be coming in the next two or three years. Mm-hmm. They still want to win now, yeah. And outside of guys like Jordan Poole, like you said, Nico Manning is still figuring out the NBA. Michael Malder is a good shooter, but outside of that, what more can you rely on him with? Their two guard depth is slim to none after Jordan Poole. So, Jordan Poole is another guy that could be involved in trades. If they take a kid like James Book Knight, who, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of people won't find out about him or haven't found out about him until these, these draft processes started in the combine. And if you if you didn't watch college basketball, you didn't know much about this kid. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've watched him for the past few years. As a freshman, when he came into UConn, he was making highlight plays and he had a lot of raw offensive potential. And in the second season at UConn, he started to hone it more and started to get more of it together. He's a good shooter, not a great. People are thinking he could be an elite shooter, but that projection you never know. Yeah. Some dudes take that next step, some don't. And see, I think that's where my other concern is too, is that if the Warriors want to win now, they need to get back to that shooting type atmosphere, I feel like. But here's the thing. I think they've they've realized that things have somewhat changed with them over the years. You have Steph and Clay, mm-hmm. but I don't think you can you're not going to put a, another roster together like you had in 16, 17, and 18. Mm-hmm. So getting a guy like James Knight, who in my mind, he reminds me of, of like Monte Ellis. He is going to be a trusted, probably off the bench to start. Yeah. He's going to be a trusted guy that gets you buckets from the start. And as he grows, he could go from like 12 points to like 16 to eventually like 19, 20. And where he goes from there is unpredictable because nobody knew Monte Ellis was going to be almost 30 points a game mm-hmm. when he first got to the Warriors. But when he first came into the league, he was instant explosion and scoring off the bench. Yeah. And I think that's what James Booknight is. So if they pick him, 
I wouldn't be mad. I'd rather them take Davion Mitchell. I was just about to say. Yeah, because I think if you're like considering making future moves with guards, Davion Mitchell is the guy who comes in. He's ready right now. Or if you're looking to win, you want a guy that plays defense. Yes, Davion Mitchell is going to be one of the 10 best defensive guards in the NBA from the jump. And he shot over 40% from three in his last year at Baylor, which is why we agree he'd be a better fit for the Warriors. Mm. But looking at their two-guard depth, I would completely understand if they took Book Knight here because you need more of a punch. Yes, you have Jordan Poole. Michael Mulder is a pretty good shooter. But after that, you have a bunch of guys that you can't really rely on. Yes, Juan Toscato has shown he plays hard on both ends. He can hit the occasional three. But he doesn't give you the punch that James Wook Knight could give you on the offensive end. Yeah. So if they took him, I wouldn't be mad, but I'd, I'd prefer Davion Mitchell yeah. if they took him there. Right. I, th- I think the Warriors are, again, in that position where, I mean, they have some options. Yeah. Um, speaking of Davion Mitchell, in this uh, mock draft, they have him going to the Orlando Magic at the eighth spot. Um, I also think that this would be a, a, a decent fit for them. I know they've gotten a lot of guards in recent yeah. drafts, and that's kind of the issue here. They just added uh, Hampton yeah, from the Nuggets. So they they Cole... just brought him in. They got Cole Anthony, who's the future. Yeah. Markel was looking like the truth, right. like what, what he was supposed to be. Then he got hurt. He's coming back. Yeah, I, I think the, the reason, though, that I do like Davion Mitchell for a young team like this with a new coach, he can set the culture for your team. Right. And I yeah. think that could be a big thing. Like, if he's going to play hard defense – you're going to have that leader on the court somewhat. And again, we talked about it before where they still have young, talented players. If they can stay healthy, they got guys like Jonathan Isaac, maybe coming back. Maybe they'll figure out how to use Mo Bamba at some point. Cole Anthony's looked a little promising here and there. RJ Hampton's shown some signs. So like they, they still have some building blocks. Wendell Carter that they picked up. Exactly. He, he was the shining star of all the moves they made. Wendell, right. he, he really showed some great signs of being the future at big man for them, which is, Awkward because they drafted Mo Bamba and right. although they gave him more playing time in the last few months, it still was it was clear that Wendell was the better option mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and again, Orlando's in that position, and because they have two picks, um, pretty close together, you want to take best available at that five spot, and then something sure, and then something yes, exactly something a little or the bit closest more, thing, right? Yeah, exactly something that's a little more safe yeah. per se but also i think like fits into their mold of what they might need um yeah. guard depth is never something that's you can overlook yeah and you you want young fiery guys to be able to play for your yeah. team that he's have, a he's a winner yeah so I, I like that pick for orlando the more we talked about it the more i i, I honestly love that pick mm-hmm. if they ended up with kuminga and and davion mitchell that would be great yeah i feel like it'd be them. good um on to sacramento who have the nine pick they have them taking Kai Jones because Marvin Bagley, he's he, he'll be out. He soon. wants out. Listen, Marvin Bagley's dad won't stop talking about how he needs to go. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's been somewhat of a mess. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they'll be moving on from that soon. Yeah. And I mean, their front court is odd. I guess uh, they've been riding they, Rashawn Holmes. He's he's been their best center option, and honestly, Rashawn Holmes he honestly had like his best year as a pro. Mm-hmm. He played really well for them, but yeah, when Rashawn Holmes is your best option, right? Yeah, you have to look at other things. Yeah, and I mean, in recent years, Texas has produced a lot of good big guys. Now Mo Bamba again, you know he's my guy, but they haven't played him a lot. But you know we've seen Jackson Hayes; he's looked pretty solid. Um, so Kai Jones, kind of. I mean, he's kind of that similar vein. Um, he can he can shoot a little bit. He can move a little bit. He's long. Yeah, he he's one of the most like intriguing prospects of this draft because he's almost seven feet tall. Yeah, he moves like a guard almost. Like he's fluid when he runs. There's no wasted motion. He doesn't move slow. Right. And like you said, he shoots a decent percentage from three. Mm-hmm. Like he he has a bunch of like natural instincts and skills, yeah. That most people don't have, mm-hmm. but it's kind of scary to me at the same time, because he he is so raw. Yeah, he almost looks like a dude that like you'd watch like at an AAU tournament, 
and you watch him play like for a quarter and you're like, who is this kid? Mm-hmm. Like, is he the number one player in the country? Who, who was Kai Jones? Right. And in workouts, that's exactly what he looks like. And at times at Texas during this last season, that's what he looked like. Right. But he's so young. I don't, I think he's only, I think he said he's, he started taking basketball seriously when he was like 16 or 17. Mm-hmm. So this is something he's just like, he's three or four years into like really understanding basketball, right. but he has all this untapped potential and skill. Mm-hmm. So him going into the Kings organization, a player like that. <laughs> yeah. It's spooky. Uh, I yeah. get the concern. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. Like it, it really it, is. It makes sense. But an organization like the Kings who have been, Notably pretty awful. Outside of Boogie Cousins, what's the track record with big men? Yeah. No, I agree. And although Marvin Bagley has been hurt, it's it's just more like signs of like just darkness, dark clouds mm-hmm. comes over them whenever they invest in young big men. They either pick the wrong ones or dudes get hurt or it's it's always something. Yeah. Now. So, what? Overall. Uh-huh. It is is it's just shaky overall yeah. to you. Yeah. But yeah. I mean at the same time The talent is there. At the same time, this is where this draft starts to get interesting. Kind of weird. So like there's not yeah. a whole lot available for them. At this point, this is when there are some European prospects mm-hmm. that are that could possibly go around this area that we haven't mentioned, but right. this is the point where all those guys come into the fold. Yep. And there's just yeah, it's all up in the air from this point on. Yeah. Now number ten for a Pelicans fan, I think this one is fun. Um, they have Keon Johnson, who, if people didn't see, had a 48-inch vertical at the NBA Combine, yeah. and that is what put him in this top 10 discussion. He had potentially the best dunk of the college season, yeah. where he he caught a pass off an of inbound on the baseline and just sprung on like a 7-foot dude yeah. and just put it on him. Like His bounce is unusually like... Yeah. It's weird how much he can bounce just catch Mm -hmm. up. Right. Now, you think, okay, sweet. We have two dudes on this team that can jump out of the gym, Zion and Keon Johnson. Well, Jackson Hayes, too. And Jackson. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Jackson Hayes, too, for a big guy. Um, They could be the new iteration of Lob City, in my opinion. But they'd have to keep Lonzo, I think, for that. But people probably will overlook that he is a really good defender. And that, I think, can help this Pelicans team. That's that's a thing that they're lacking is defense. Um, just another high-motor guy works into the same – I mean, that's what they're doing with Zion. So it's – now, granted, he's nowhere near what Zion is, obviously. But just having somebody that can, you know, go in and become a, a threat athletically and defensively is really good. He's not the greatest uh, – shooter or anything yeah, he's, 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 got a, some... he's an average he has some holes in his game he's an average yeah. shooter right now mm-hmm. his handle is good not great it's still a little loose but right. yeah when there's a reason why he was like a top 10 player in the country yeah like sixth or seventh but i also feel like he he has like if they go this route they can use maybe use brandon ingram as a way to show him hey look look how much development brandon ingram has Again, Brandon Ingram, another guy that had even more potential going in, but kind of being able to expand his game, you you have a guy like that that, you know, Brandon Ingram became even better shooter um over the last few years. Yeah. I think under a coach like Stan Van Gundy, this might be mishandled. Mm-hmm. But now that it's not completely official, but it's almost official at this point. Yeah. Them hiring Willie Green to me is almost perfect. Mm-hmm. Willie what Willie has done in terms of development in terms of just all, all around coaching and helping the guys learn the game, it, he's done a great job yeah. at every stop he's been at in the NBA. And now he's getting his shot to lead a team. And who knows, every assistant isn't built to lead a team. But Willie has paid his dues, and he clearly has the ability to get the best out of guys and and to develop guys. Mm-hmm. And they're going to listen to him more than they've ever – they barely listened to Stan Van Gundy. Yeah. At the end, they almost didn't at all. Right. And I think Willie Green is going to get something out of these dudes, and they're, they're going to be able to relate to, 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 to Willie Green, and they're going to respond to what he says. Yeah. Um, 
also just to note that Josh Hart and James Johnson are going to become free agents. So also makes sense to get a little wing depth there. Yeah. Um, moving on to 11, which <laughs> this one's kind of funny. Charlotte Hornets getting Moses Moody when they have LaMelo, Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham. I don't really know where Moses Moody fits in here necessarily. Well, how long do you think they're going to keep uh, the the twins? I forgot their last name. The Martin twins. Yeah how how long do you think they're going to keep the Martin twins? I don't Cody think they. I, I don't think they're going to invest. They might keep one of them, but I don't see them investing in both of them for a long time. Yeah. Terry Rozier is mainly a scorer, but he's a point guard. Lamelo is the point guard in general of that team. Right. And Devontae Graham is like pretty much like the backup point guard. Yeah. So you need a real two guard. You need a real shooting guard with like real size. Moses Moody is like six six, six seven. He has good length, a good wingspan. And he he just has natural scoring instincts. He has a nice jumper. He can get into the lane when he wants. He's not crazy athletic, but he's athletic enough to take off when he needs to. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that can be a reliable scorer with length. And he has good defensive potential, too. And T- Terry Rozier and Devontae Graham, they're not going to guard that much. They'll play hard, but you can't really rely on them to be really good defenders. Seven, Moses Moody, 6'7", long arms. <clears throat> and can be pretty good on both ends of the floor. So yeah. I would understand the pick. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it just makes – I don't know. I'm a little confused. Um, I mean, who, who, else, who else would you consider them to Yeah, be? I mean, I would say they'd need a big man. And right at this spot in the draft, it's hard to – Maybe pick one out. I mean, I, I don't think um, Isaiah Jackson is going to go that high. Right. It's possible that he could, but in I think he's going to go between the, like, 14 and 20 range, Isaiah, Isaiah Jackson. But, yeah, I don't think he goes 11. Yeah. Although, uh, I, I think Charlotte worked him out, and they're looking at him. Um, San Antonio Spurs at 12. No surprise here. They go with the uh, – The Austria, I mean, the international prospect. Yeah, the – the potential that a lot of people keep looking at, Josh Giddy. 6A ball handler. I think the Spurs are a good organization for that kind of thing. Um, I haven't been able to see a ton of him. I know that he's also been he's getting a lot of looks from a lot of teams. He uh, didn't make the Australian national team, so a lot of people were kind of disappointed they're not going to be able to see him in the Olympics. I thought he, said, I thought he just said he wasn't going to play. Because he played with them yesterday. Maybe. Maybe that's what it was. That's what I I think I I think they even said during the game. They interviewed him and he said, I wish I I wish I could have played I wish I could play with Australia in the Olympics, but I won't. Or he said like if I was playing with them but I'm not. He said something like that. I think he I think he's just getting prepared for the draft. Gotcha. So yeah, we haven't didn't get able to see any extended run against like other NBA guys that he would have in the Olympics. Um, but I can understand going into a draft that you want to play it on the cautious side. But I think that's a good fit for him, uh, for the Spurs. I mean, Spurs are in a weird spot, but guard depth for them I think is good because they might move on from DeMar DeRozan, Yeah, I would think. From what I saw from him, he, he has good size. He He's a legit point guard. He's a really good passer. He has a decent jumper. I've seen clips where he hits like a lot of threes in a game, but I don't think it happens like often. Mm-hmm. He has a good enough jumper right now, but I think in terms of like overall game, like handle and all that stuff, he has he has a lot to work on. Yeah. So if you take him at twelve, you're you're investing in him like three or four years down the road. Right. Um, thirteen for the Indiana Pacers have them taking Franz Wagner from Michigan. I like it. Um, it adds to their wing depth, which I feel like they've solidified pretty well at this point with the Karis LeVert trade. Um, TJ Warren hopefully coming back from injury. But it's nice because it just gives them more bench depth. And again, the Pacers are one of the deepest teams in the league if they can stay healthy. And if you get a guy like Franz Wagner who, you know, he has some question marks going into this draft. We know, like, his skill set and what he could become. Having a guy like Karis LeVert, I feel like, is perfect. A guy that went to Michigan, a guy that had a good, I, like somewhat of a similar skill set, but 
like Karis LeVert had a lot of question marks going into the NBA and he has turned into a stud. Yeah. And th- there's been times where Karis LeVert is borderline playing like an all-star. Um, he is which, pretty much. He's, he's their go-to scorer now, which I never would have guessed out of Karis LeVert. Coming no, out of nobody, nobody would have guessed he was going to be the one from Michigan. Exactly. That became, yeah. So to have a guy like him to know what it takes to become something in the NBA, I think would be perfect for Franz. Um, so I, I like that pick overall. Yeah. I also I don't think it'll take mu- like much time for him to get like actual playing time because he has a high IQ. He's a good passer. Mm-hmm. He's a good decision maker. His offensive game is good enough. I don't know how much of a ceiling he really has. I don't th- see him like developing any like next level handle. Yeah. He has his like driving like hooks. He has his like finger rolls going underneath guys. He can take off at the rim when he wants to. He has a good a good amount of explosiveness, but he's he's like almost six nine and he's like two hundred twenty pounds. Yeah, he has real size. He can really defend. He he's a streaky shooter. But when he's on, he's on. Mm-hmm. So he's a he's a guy that can play immediately for them if they need it. Right. Uh, moving on to fourteen, Golden State. And this here's a shooter. Exactly. This <laughs> this solidifies taking Boke Knight. At seven, for me, um, they take Corey Kispert out of Gonzaga, just a pure shooter. Uh, works really well in their offense, gives them wing depth. This I would be totally okay with if they went James Bognight into Corey Kispert, uh, something like that. I think fits really well for them. I do think that they are going to try to package those two picks to make some sort of move. I don't know what it may be. Yeah, we we've even discussed them packaging those two picks to. Yeah, try and do something. There's a lot of different uh, rumors out there, but I, I like Corey Kispert going to the Warriors. It's kind of a no-brainer fit, at least. You have any ex- extra thoughts on it? It's it's perfect to me. If they ended up with Boog Knight and Corey Kispert at the end of the first, I yeah. think that's that's almost that's a celebration for them. Yeah, because you you have two guys. Boog Knight might take a little bit to get acclimated to the NBA, but really, Kispert is coming off screens and just like getting open, right, and shooting. Yeah, that's all he has to do. Mm-hmm. And when he's when he's practicing with Stephen Clay, the competitiveness is at an all time high when they're shooting. Yeah, and going as long as they can without missing, it, it it won't do anything but make him better. Right. Um. And then let's round out the lottery with the Washington Wizards, uh, taking Jalen Johnson out of Duke, the big man. This freshman. is a this is a kid that a lot of people thought would be a top ten, maybe top five pick mm-hmm. before the college season started, but. He had some injuries, he had some ups and downs, and he ended the season early and just decided to prepare for the draft. Yep. Um, could be a steal. Yeah. Um, could be somewhat of a bust, but we never know. But for the Wizards, I think they're in that place where, I don't know, they're in a weird spot because they have Very. Russ and Bradley Beal, but then they have Denny Avija, Rui Hachimura, and then if they went Jalen Johnson, they'd have three really young kind of – wing front court players I mean, you you got daniel gafford who's a third year center that's yeah almost if they wanted to replace uh thomas bryant thomas bryant they could because mm-hmm. daniel gafford fit in with them so well yeah but yeah they're they're stuck in a place where they're still they're still holding on to trying to win yeah when they just need to embrace the youth yep like get trade bradley bill maybe hold on for russ one more season and then ship him too you got to embrace these guys yeah that you've drafted in these past few years because they've shown Rui has shown he's a keeper. Yeah. And Denny showed signs. I was gonna say, even Denny before his injury, he showed some signs, but he needs he needs the ball in his hands exactly. more to be able to exactly. develop. Yeah. Um so yeah. I, I would like this pick, I think, for the Wizards, but they'd have to I agree, they have to buy into the rebuild. Okay. So that's basically it. Um we'll talk a couple more draft things next week. We're getting closer to the draft again at the end of the month. Um, maybe we'll talk about some more like sleeper prospects or something like that. We'll figure something out. Maybe we'll look for a n- updated mock draft as well. Yeah, for for anybody wondering who the 16th pick was to OKC, it's Alperin Sengun, who I I saw one scouting video the Ringer did on him. He's like an old school, literally real like 80s level like center mm-hmm. that like is really good in the post, but is. I don't think he's built for today's game. Yeah. He he has some skill, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, okay. Let's swap over to baseball real quick because I want to get through. I want to talk about the home run derby and all-star game. 
because uh, I watch more of that. If we have time at the end, we'll talk about the Olympic basketball. There's still going to be a few more exhibitions anyway that we could talk about later. Um, so the home run derby happened on uh, Monday night, just this Monday night. And honestly, one of the best home run derbies I've watched in a while. Yeah, it was really entertaining. I try to catch most of them uh, for the most part, um, but it's been hard sometimes because it goes late into the night and you never know what's going to happen. But this one was just great from the get-go. They've been doing the rounds um, where they pit each other against another batter and they have three rounds. And almost every matchup was super close. Um, Shohei Otani versus Juan Soto. Juan Soto beat him in a hit off at the end. Juan Soto had to hit three straight home runs to beat him. Hit all of them. Which was crazy. Yeah. Um, Pete Alonso broke the round record hitting 35. And then I thought Salvador Perez had no chance. Salvador Perez finished with 29, I believe, which is now the second highest. Um, which was that was a crazy round as well. Um, Trey Mancini was kind of the story of the night, uh, recovering from colon clan- cancer a year ago and then making it into this. And he beat Matt Olson in his opening round by one. Uh, Trevor Story, the hometown kid for uh, Colorado, beat out. Um, who did he beat out? Oh, he beat out Joey Gallo in the first round. Joey Gallo. Yep. The- Joey Gallo yeah, maybe the Gallo. only disappointment in this first round um, because his his pitcher and him just were off on synergy. So Joey Gallo was the number two seed, didn't make it into the next round. And then in the second round, you had Juan Soto going up against Pete Alonso, who Pete Alonso just looked incredible in this. And then you had Mancini go up against Trevor Story. That one was kind of upsetting. Trevor Story didn't look very good. He looked gassed. Um, but Mancini got into a rhythm and pulled it out. So you got a Pete Alonso Trey Mancini final, which I thought was great. Mancini, uh, I think he had twenty three or twenty four in the final round. Um, they 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 both went to a bonus. Yeah, I think. And yeah, Mancini went went ahead of him by like I think it was six or seven home runs. Mm-hmm. And Pete Alonso got a minute and he hit seven straight. Yeah. It was it was just stupid. He went into a different zone. Yeah. And so now Pete Alonso has won the two home run derbies that he's been a part of in the three years that he's been in the league. So every year that they've had a home run derby since his rookie season, he's won it. Um, which is really cool. He he loves it. And I think this is a thing that the NBA guys need to look at. Pete Alonso prepares for the home run derby. He picked out his pitching coach to be his pitcher because in his first year, he felt like his cousin was good, but not great. And he studies the stadiums when he goes into these home run derbies, which I think is really cool. Um, We saw it a little bit with the dunk contest with like Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon actually like really taking it seriously. But I like when a guy takes these fun games that are more for the crowd than for the actual players that he's taking it seriously and he's having a blast doing it. Every it, time it's, it's the high lo- highest level of fun competition there is. Exactly. And every time they cut to like a pause, I know at one point one of the kids got hurt out in the outfield. I saw when they walked the kid off. And Pete Alonso was just like singing and kind of dancing to the to music that was playing in the background. He was just having a good good time. And that's what I liked about the home run derby. It felt like everybody was having a really good time, a lot of cool storylines. Um And, I mean, Coors Field helps with that because they're in Colorado. The ball just gets blasted. Um, They hit a a bunch of 500-footers. And it's just just a lot of fun. Yeah. I I came into it because of Shohei Otani, who's Mm -hmm. just been getting me so much back into baseball. Yeah. And I ended it just enjoying the whole home run derby. I – I haven't enjoyed a derby like that since maybe like I was in middle school. Yeah. Like that's the last time I used to watch these types of things every single year and I was excited for them. Yep. But yeah, like once, once Otani like started out slow, I was like, I don't know how much I'm going to be into this. But then he picked it up, him and Juan Soto tied. And then 
once he got to that round and Juan Soto just locked in and hit three straight. Hats off. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm back in. Like, yeah. it's, this isn't just Otani anymore. Like, yeah. I'd, I'm interested in these dudes, these these young, exciting prospects yeah. that are just becoming stars. And, and I thought the fun thing for me, too, is like, you see Ken Griffey Jr. on the sidelines with a big old yeah. camera taking <laughs> pictures of all these guys. It's just, just funny. Like, you don't, like, people, I'm sure there was a ton of young, like, any young kids that watched didn't know who that was. And that's it's like odd. is like one of the best home run hitters of all time. They, they're they're like maybe like a couple thousand kids where their dad was like, you know who that is, right? Yeah. And they're mm-hmm. like, who? Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you about Ken. Hey, it's take a seat. <laughs> but yeah, I, I thought it was great. Um, I didn't watch as much of the All Star game as you did, but I, from what you said, it seemed like the All Star game was pretty fun. Um, you got to see a lot of the young prospects that are have kind of made this league now um and vlad greer jr got the mvp hit a couple he hit a home run had a couple rbis and just looked great what did you think about the yeah, all-star I'll, game itself i only watched the first two innings so i can't give like full analysis yeah. but it was all it was still packed with action pretty much in that first two innings like coming out shohei otani was just pitching his like level of skill was just on display. Mm-hmm. He hit Tatis with a breaking ball that just like sent him swinging, and it was nasty. His fastball was on. He had a ninety-seven and an a hundred. Then they got to Vlad Guerrero. His first ba- like bat, home run, almost knocked it out the park. It was it was just mm-hmm. I haven't enjoyed watching baseball like that in a long time. Yeah, and it it felt pretty good. Even though it was just two innings, the fact that I enjoyed that much of it, and the fact that I went to a Tigers game just two weekends ago, yeah, yeah, for both of us went. I said it like I I went and you didn't. No, I didn't. I wasn't. <laughs> you there. didn't. Oh my god, <laughs> my brain is scrambling. The fact that you came the next day, the fact that we went to that Tigers game, and even though they lost, just being in that atmosphere was pretty cool. And yeah, just being back into baseball slowly like this is pretty nice i even watched the first round of the baseball draft there you go so yeah getting back into the no pun intended the swing of things right yeah and i think that's something that people don't really realize is like i think the the mlb is in a good a good place for young players yeah but again it goes back to their their marketing and like it doesn't seem like they market enough for their players to get people into baseball. And I I get it. We we talked about it before. I get all the arguments against it. But right now, baseball seems like it's in a really good place if if you're a fan. Um so it's really cool and I agree. I I've been enjoying getting back into baseball a bit. Yeah, it's it's almost like the level of talent has almost reached like the talent in the late 90s and early 2000s was still super high. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. But steroids took it to like a different stratosphere. Yeah, it's like today's level of talent is like matching the steroids era mm-hmm. in terms of like talent. They might not be smacking like eighty home runs, but this Shohei Otani, there, there's nobody like this. Yeah. Fernando Tatis is so versatile and ri- like ridiculous. Vlad Guerrero is even more powerful than his dad. Like these young dudes have so much talent. Yep. And it is it does suck that the ad, the advertisements and the they don't get the visibility they deserve. Yeah. But there are people coming back to baseball. Like I've I've seen so many comments, whether it's on YouTube or Twitter or other places, where people are like, either I've never watched baseball or I haven't watched baseball in ten, fifteen years and Shohei Otani is getting me back into it. Yeah. Or like, yeah, like people are saying like this home run derby is the best they've seen in years. Yeah. Like it, it's it's getting back in a good place, hopefully people start paying more attention to baseball in general because it used to be known as America's pastime right. in terms of sports. And it really hasn't been that way in a very long time. Yeah. All right, that's all we got for today. Uh, ran out of time, unfortunately. So next week, we'll uh, cover some Olympic basketball. Maybe it'll get brighter than it was. Um, NBA 2K covers got announced, so we'll talk about that next week too real quick. Um, we'll go over the MLB draft, I think, a little bit. And then there's some NBA coaching things that might end up happening, like we kind of talked about Willie Green. It looks like it's going to happen. Um, but there's a other, couple other coaching positions that could get filled uh, maybe by next week. So 
We'll talk about those next week. We'll have more NBA Finals. Maybe the NBA Finals are over next week. Um, and we step one, clo- one step closer to the draft and the Olympics. This has been Views from the Sideline. We'll see you guys next time. We also could get a special guest, my friend Alex for baseball, finally.